member for Mackilla. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by congratulating the member for Solomon for being appointed to his new role to encourage trade from the Northern Territory. He must, however, promise this House that he will not wear his safari suit north of Darwin, and for God's sake, don't get stuck in a karaoke bar singing. The damage you could do to our trading relationships with so many people is untold. <laughs> well, we have been warned, Madam Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. So, but I do thank the member for Solomon for his um, very worthy uh, contribution to this debate. Um, in about 1800, a gentleman by the name of David Ricardo came up with the idea of comparative and absolute advantage when it came to trade. He realised that trade was not just beneficial to nations just because you are able to um, produce goods or services, or mostly goods at that time, more efficiently than your trading partner and therefore trade with them. He realised that even when you do it less efficiently than your trading partners, that it is still beneficial to both, to both countries to trade. The benefits of trade are enormous. We only talk about the economic be benefits in this place, unfortunately. But when they were talking about the Corn Laws in the United Kingdom between 1810 and 1850, where Malthus was saying that we should um, in, uh, drive up the price of uh, food uh, so that people on lower incomes, or as, as they were, as he called them then, poor people, would not be able to um, afford as much food because he said that we would ultimately we were reproducing human beings at a much faster rate than our capacity to grow food. So he was very much in favour of the Corn Laws. Um, however, Ricardo was able to show that this was uh, short-term thinking. But the primary reason was not economic. The primary reason was actually peace. Ricardo and, Will, and William Wilberforce and people like Pitt the Younger um, were able to demonstrate or always felt that if England could trade with France, the likelihood of them continuing to fight wars would decrease. Um, after the end of World War II, uh, the architects of modern Europe and, and what became known as the EU were not primarily after economic benefits, they are after peace dividends. They realised that if Germany and France's economies could be drawn closer together, that the incentives for there being war would massively decrease. Now, in our lifetime, it is inconceivable that Germany and France would go to war, <coughs> though anything is possible. We may send the members for Solomon to sing in, in a Berlin bar at some point wearing a safari suit. This could set off God knows what chain reactions. But in the unlikelihood that that ever happened, um, we, it is inconceivable that these two countries would ever go to war. And that has been primarily because of trade. When we talk about trade in the Western, and, uh, Western world or in developed worlds, we think about um, the sometimes how that has impacted uh, the real wages of people on, um, who were uh, with, in semi-skilled or low-skilled labour. Indeed, in the United States, real wages for people in the bottom 60 per cent of their income curve have not seen a real wage increase or a material wage increase since the mid-80s. That was primarily because at the end of the 80s, um, we opened the world to things like um, through the World Trade Organisations to countries like China. A billion people, a billion low-skilled workers became part of the international labour market. We think about it in terms of the impact and the cost to people in places like the United States, in places like Western Europe. But what we don't think about is the poverty that we ended in so many places around the world. Um, in my lifetime, uh, since 1990, we have lifted nearly two and a half billion people out of poverty. And not the sort of poverty where you, know, you can't afford the latest iPhone, the sort of poverty where mothers would have to choose between feeding themselves or feeding their children. Free trade. Trade has lifted more than two billion people out of back-breaking po back poverty globally. It, we have shifted more people out of poverty in the last 30 years than all the United Nations programs didn't achieve from the 1950s onwards. It is a modern miracle and one that we do not spend enough time talking about. So when we come into this place and talk about our trade surpluses and our free trade agreements and how well the Australian economy is doing, it is right and proper that we do so. But I don't want us to ignore the fact that free trade in so many other places in the world has been the difference between life and death and war and peace.
Thank you.